Yeah, I can never remember ever not having this uh, love affair with the game of football. I remember when I was a little kid and the, uh, the people over the road used to get the Argus, which was a morning paper in Melbourne, and it was the only one that carried colour photos of the teams. And I just could not wait to wake up when there was going to be a team photo in the Argus and Mrs Wilson would have the paper for me and I'd go over and get it. And it was just, things like that were just treasures to me. You'd go to the footy with your family, back for the same side, yell and scream, you know, get abused by a rival spectator. That's all part of it. And there she is, a demented North Melbourne fan. I love that tribal element and the family element of football. And that's what they call the nail in the coffin. Each Saturday, it's just sort of a, a, a new event. I've been to the MCG in my life, I would say, 1,500 times. Every time I walk in there, um, particularly if, it's, if the expectation's there about a big game, I get that tingle up my spine about what we might see in the next two and a half hours. Welcome to part one of a special Herald Sun presentation, celebrating 150 years of Australian football, our game. It's certainly come a long way from a pastime to keep cricketers fit during the winter, a suggestion made by Tom Wills back in 1858. He and a few like-minded mates rustled up some rugby balls and persuaded some friends and acquaintances into participating in some informal matches at Yarra Park near what will ultimately become the site of the MCG. The Melbourne Football Club was subsequently formed and by May of 1859 the club had drafted a handwritten document formally outlining 10 basic rules of this new code. None of these footballing pioneers could possibly have dreamed that 150 years later their ad hoc game would be enshrined as an Australian sporting phenomenon. Hoping for Corey Harley. Oh, Chapman! When the Victorian Football Association was formed to formalise and coordinate the game in 1877, the code received the official regulation and control it had been crying out for. But by the mid-1890s, a number of the wealthier and more influential clubs were disillusioned with the VFA's central management and formed a breakaway competition to be known as the Victorian Football League for season 1897. Geelong, Essendon, South Melbourne, Fitzroy, Collingwood and Melbourne invited Carlton and St Kilda to join them and the VFL was born. A primarily amateur pursuit for most of the 20th century, football began its transformation towards full professionalism in the early 1970s players becoming increasingly disillusioned about increased demands on their time not being matched by increased pay packets. Threats of industrial action and coordinated player revolts ultimately led the VFL to loosen player payment regulations, wages quickly exploding out of control. Only the richest clubs had any hope of keeping pace and by the mid-1980s half the clubs in the VFL were either technically bankrupt or perilously close to it. The VFL's wage dilemma quickly spread around the country, with SANFL and WAFL clubs unable to keep pace. Many had been living off the exorbitant transfer fees being paid for their top players by Victorian clubs. So when those same clubs started to run out of money in the mid-80s, Australian football faced a national crisis. It was broke. In the space of little more than a decade, the game we loved had become a business and fundamental changes had to be made for it to survive into the 21st century. The national draft and salary cap were introduced to regulate VFL player payments and ensure that the gap between the richer and poorer clubs didn't lead to such on-field inequity. Just five clubs had shared the 23 VFL premierships on offer between 1967 and 1989. But in the 18 years since 1990, 11 different clubs have tasted the game's ultimate success as the competition has gone national. The people have waited 72 years. Here it is! Australian football is healthier than it's ever been, with record attendances, membership levels and television ratings to prove it. Much has changed about our game, but one thing that has remained constant across the entire 150 years, the passion of the fans.
I love every aspect of footing. Every aspect. It's great. The happiness, the sadness, the challenges, the commitment, the highs, you know, the joy, the crying. I mean, how, isn't it amazing to watch a game of footy and watch people cry after it? You think they're inconsolable. You think what? What could you possibly say to that person to make his life better? And there's nothing. He's got to cry himself, cry, him out, cry himself out of it, and then pick himself up and you move on to the next year. In the meantime, over there, you've got grown men kissing each other <laughs> and hugging each other. And nowhere was the passion more apparent than at the old suburban grounds. Conditions were primitive by modern standards and the atmosphere was openly hostile to the visiting army. But this was your fortress, your home patch to be defended with every ounce of endeavour on the field and supported with every ounce of passion and fervour off it. A road trip in the old days may have only taken you minutes up the road, but you may as well have been on the other side of the continent. Victory snatched away from arch rivals on their home turf would have be savoured like no other. From the old crepe paper race covers through to the giant modern day banners. From informal supporter groups to the coordinated cheer squads of today. This is the lifeblood of our game. Australian football has been at the centre of rural life throughout its 150 year existence. For so many country towns, the footy club is the centre of their social universe. Life on the land can be a lonely one. Footy has given so many of our farming folk a reason to get off the tractor, head into town and become part of the local community. Rivalries between adjacent country towns have been every bit as passionate as those between their more famed suburban city counterparts. And endless is the number of footballing superstars that have grown up kicking a footy around dusty old paddocks out in the bush, dreaming of one day heading to the big smoke to take on the best in the land. Footy is the lifeblood of these places. Um, the, the passion, you talk about romance of footy. Any footballer, any kid who plays football, being it a Gunder guy, being at Bendigo, being at Melbourne, going to uh, Kerry Grammar, if you are good enough, you can play AFL footy. It's open to everyone. It matters not when, where or how you got Australian football into your blood. Once it's there, it's there forever. Whether you were born into the game or fell in love with it somewhere and somehow along the way, once it's touched you and you felt the thrill of the big mark, the freak goal or the impossible win against all odds, our game will have you hooked. As long as there's been footy, there have been superstars for us to idolise. Whilst Australian football is the ultimate team game, individual brilliance constantly shines through. For many, it's where their love affair with our game begins. The seemingly larger-than-life hero who adorns our bedroom wall and whose every move and idiosyncrasy is studied and imitated. The arrival of television in 1956 brought us closer to our heroes than ever before. Most of them disappeared until TV came along. They were great players, then they just went and bought a hotel or went up the country and played and coached. But then TV came along and gave us, and, they, and we saw their identity off the football field and their humour um, and, and just what sort of people they were. My God, I taught you a few tricks of the game too, You right? did? Yeah, <laughs> especially that nice little backhander as you were kicking. <laughs> and no one made that transition from footballer to media star better than Lou Richards. A tenacious rover, Lou bled black and white in 250 games for his beloved Collingwood, captaining the Pies to the 1953 Premiership before retiring late in 1955. His larger-than-life personality quickly transformed him into our game's biggest multimedia megastar. A legitimate star of newspapers and radio, it was the emergence of television that best suited Lou's cheeky, quick-witted style. The great Australian Pie. The first person that actually uh, crossed all boundaries in football. I mean, he was an entertainer, he was an ex-player, he was a businessman, he was radical, uh, he was cheeky, he had the whole mix. And I think he was the first of those personalities that went from football to the media. I don't think there's ever been anyone bigger since. Lou, I think, is untouchable as a media person. I mean, just yesterday we were talking about world of sport and we were just talking about what we used to do on Sunday mornings from three different generations. And, 
You know, World of Sport was just Lou's vehicle. There was a period of time when World of Sport was on and he was writing for The Sun. He was the biggest name in football, of, including the current players of the time. Jack Dyer provided Lou with the perfect foil. Big, strong and menacing on the field, Dyer was a gentle giant off it. Little Louie was the complete opposite. Jack captain coached Richmond from 1941 until his playing retirement after a then record 312 games at the end of 1949, remaining on as coach of the Tigers until the end of 1952. Nicknamed Captain Blood after the Errol Flynn pirate movie of the era, he dished it out and copped it back in equal measure. The darling of the Tiger Army, he was the lead villain for opposition supporters, winning the club best and fairest six times. Jack Dye was a natural comic. He didn't always mean to be, but he had lovely delivery. Uh, he, he, he sort of, I won't say anything unless I say something, was what Jack Dye's motto. And so he did good ordinary football and the rest of it, whereas Lou was always yapping like a little dog and full of confidence. My father would say to me, do Lou Richards and Jack Dye really detest each other? Because that's what came across. And that was very good theatre. And Bob Davis played a very big part in it too. And uh, never forget his contribution to the game of football. A Western Suburbs working class hero, Ted Whitten debuted for his beloved Bulldogs at the age of 17 and went on to play a league record 321 games, including the Doggies' first premiership in 1954. A five-time best and fairest, EJ coached the Dogs for 13 years in two separate stints and is universally regarded as one of the toughest yet sublimely talented and versatile players to ever pull on a boot. His character as the lovable Aussie larrikin further cemented his place in footy folklore. Stuck it right up them. That's what you did. You stuck it right up them. Witten becoming a multimedia legend. The nickname Mr Football said it all. He had this unique ability to embrace all, all cultures of, of people, like the rich and famous, the battler, and Ted was the boy from Braybrook. But he, he, he crossed all margins, if, if that's the right thing to say. He, he had a connection with everyone. He, he, when I was looking at him on TV, he was like my favourite uncle. He's always cracking jokes. There's more presence with Ted Whitten than any person I've met in football, including Ron Barassi. Whitten walked into a room and everyone stopped. And he had that way about him. And he knew everyone's name. All the blokes who played in that era, so Skilton, Barassi, Aylett, all say Whitten was the best all-round footballer. So that's all you need to hear. Ronald Dale Barassi, quite simply the most famous name our game has ever known. The son of a Melbourne player killed in action in World War II, Barassi lived with legendary demon supercoach Norm Smith as a teenager and grew to become a superstar in his own right. He revolutionised ruck roving, using his strength to barrel through packs on his way to six Melbourne premierships, two as captain. Barassi then shocked the football world when he accepted an offer to join Carlton as captain coach in 1965. It was a massive story. It was the front page story in the Melbourne Herald. Barassi was the most famous and most popular Melbourne player in the history of that football club. And here he was at the end of uh, a premiership year. Um, the great hero, the captain, Norm Smith's almost adopted son, saying he was going to play for the, uh, for the enemy. Footy changed, I think, from that day. No player had gone of that ilk before Barassi to cause that sort of pain for supporters. There was a sort of, as I said, the disbelief about how could he... I mean, it was almost then seen to be um, treachery that you could actually leave your footy club. Barassi would go on to guide the Blues to the 1968 and 1970 premierships before leading perennial cellar dwellers North Melbourne out of the wilderness and to their first two flags in 1975 and 77. Our game has been blessed with some wonderfully gifted big men, starting with the great Roy Kazali, a legendary St Kilda and South Melbourne ruckman of the 1910s and 20s, whose spectacular leap immortalised his name in footy folklore forever. Graham Polly Farmer arrived at Geelong from Western Australia in 1962 as a 27-year-old with a massive reputation, having won three Sandover medals with East Perth. He can genuinely lay claim to being one of but a few to have single-handedly changed the style of our game, in his case through the use of handball as an attacking weapon, rather than as a means of getting out of trouble. Polly's ability to pump out a 30-metre handball to a teammate on the run when combined with his sublime rucking skills, made for an unstoppable package. 
I've never seen a player handball before like Polly Farmer. And he had so much time. I know you, you speak about players with time, they get the ball, and it's almost like they're in slow motion. Polly played football like that. I think Polly, in my time, has changed the game more than any other player, and just with the handball. John Nichols arrived at Carlton as an afterthought. The Blues had been interested in his older brother, Don, but were forced to also take the younger brother, John, as part of the deal. Whilst Don went on to play 77 games as a handy sentiment for the Blues, his younger brother, John, went on to become a Carlton legend. Nichols grew to become a giant in every sense of the word. His shrewd football brain, the enormous tree trunk legs and those ice cold blue eyes which struck fear into the bravest of opponents. He was just such an imposing figure. He was a big man. He had those steely blue eyes that used to pierce you every time you looked at him. Um, he was aggressive. He was strong. Uh, he was very, very polished and um, massive influence in grand finals and big games. I think. He, he ranks probably in the top three or four players ever for his influence on his football team on, on any given day. Len Thompson was a completely different ruckman to Farmer and Nichols. A breathtakingly athletic young big man who was ahead of his time in becoming the prototype for the modern ruckman. His unique combination of size and mobility made him impossible to match in an era of big lumbering ruckmen. Tomo collecting the 1972 Brownlow medal and a record five Copeland trophies. He was the six foot six and a half bloke who was incredibly mobile. Uh, you see those sort of players all the time now. I mean, Jim Steins is like that, Dean Cox is like that. Len was before his time. Len was just a, a totally gifted athlete who could run 400 metres in around 50 seconds at six foot six. No one had seen an athlete who could do that. Nothing captivates the imagination of the football world like a superstar goal kicker and our game has been blessed with an endless cavalcade of greats. Collingwood's Dick Lee was one of the first truly great forwards, booting 707 goals in 230 games and leading the VFL goal kicking a remarkable 10 times between 1906 and 1922. His role as Magpie Spearhead was eventually handed on to Gordon Coventry who ultimately eclipsed Lee's amazing record by kicking a phenomenal 1,299 goals in 306 games from 1920 to 1937. For all their wonderful achievements, neither Lee nor Coventry could match South Melbourne star Bob Pratt's mind-blowing performance in 1934. The mercurial full forward booted 150 goals for the season on his way to 681 from 158 games. Another goal-kicking record to have stood the test of time is the 18 goals won kicked by Melbourne's Fred Fanning against St Kilda in the final round of 1947. A few have challenged it over the years, but none have been able to conquer it. Remarkably, it was to be Fanning's final VFL game. He left league football to coach country club Hamilton in the prime of his career at just 25 years of age for nearly seven times the pay packet he was receiving at the D's. But there's always a new megastar just around the corner. Essendon youngster John Coleman bursting onto the scene with a 12-goal debut in the opening round of 1949. With an amazing 537 goals in just 98 games, Coleman was practically unstoppable, topping the VFL goal kicking four times in his five full seasons before a knee injury ended his stellar career in round eight of 1954 at the age of just 25. He was obviously an outstanding player. He was gone before he was in his mid-twenties with a knee injury that I know for a fact would, would have probably kept him out for six weeks today. I write about you know, John Coleman and he was like, I don't know, he was, he was, he was a myth. If he didn't bury for Essendon or didn't go to the game, John Coleman was just this thing you read about in the paper, like some overseas world figure. The crowd used to follow Coleman for one quarter then at that end of that quarter they'd go round to the other end of goals and see him kick another three or four goals and jump on people's backs. The people who saw him play and saw a lot of him, they say that he's as good as anyone that's ever played the game. The late 1960s and early 70s were a golden era for glamour full forwards, with three of the all-time greats strutting their stuff in an ongoing battle to be the league's leading goal kicker. Doug Wade was a big, strong, burly full forward from Horsham, who debuted for Geelong in 1961. Blessed with a spectacular leap and a glorious long punt kick, 
Wade played a key role in Geelong's 1963 Premiership win and led the Cats goal kicking 11 times in 12 years before crossing to North Melbourne under the 10-year rule to play in North's historic 1975 Premiership. Peter McKenna was footy's first pop star. The mop-topped Collingwood spearhead, sending a generation of Magpie fans into raptures with his strong marking and deadly drop punts on the field, while his vocal talents whipped them into a frenzy off it. He led the Collingwood goal kicking eight times and the league table twice, topping the ton on three occasions with a personal best of 143 goals in 1970. All up, Peter McKenna booted 874 goals in just 191 games and at the peak of his fame was quite possibly the most popular football star of them all. Peter Hudson arrived on the VFL scene at the start of 1967, having booted 469 goals in just four senior seasons in Tasmania. Hutto was a star from the outset, accumulating bags of goals seemingly at will. His brilliant use of his body to outmanoeuvre opponents was capped off by his deadly flat punts. Yeah, Peter Hudson, I've never seen a player remotely like Peter Hudson. That crouched over run up, stuttering approach, kicks this mongrel flat punt, whatever he called it, always straight. He won the Coleman medal on four occasions. His best return coming in Hawthorne's 1971 Premiership year when he equalled Bob Pratt's long-standing mark of 150 goals. But just as he had the football world at his feet, Hudson severely injured his knee in the opening round of 1972. The biggest name in football was out of the game indefinitely. Peter Hudson's return in late 1973 was every bit as dramatic as the injury itself. Arriving at VFL Park in a helicopter, Hutto booted eight goals effectively on one leg, having re-injured his troublesome knee early in the match. Did you have any thoughts about coming off at any stage? I thought I might have to do it at one stage, but uh, uh, Kanga made sure that I didn't have any more thoughts on He gave you a pep talk? No, he didn't. It's what he doesn't say that counts. He wouldn't reappear at VFL level again until 1977. The superstar enjoying another triumphant return to boot 110 goals. All in all, he kicked a phenomenal 2,191 goals in senior football on both sides of Bass Strait. His 129-game VFL career netting an incredible 727 goals at an all-time league record of more than 5.6 goals per game. The Hawks would be blessed with another all-time great full forward less than a decade after Hudson hung up his boots. Jason Dunstall arrived as a raw, solidly built youngster from Queensland in 1985. He would lead the club's goal kicking for 12 of the next 13 years, collecting four best and fairests, four All-Australians, four Coleman medals and four Premiership medals along the way. He ended his Hall of Fame career with a whopping 1,254 goals for the Mighty Hawks. Opposition clubs knew that the Hawthorne player was going to kick it to Dunstall. They knew, but they couldn't stop it. And no one could do anything about it for 14 years. While Dunster was racking up goals for the strongest team in the competition, Tony Lockett was booting bags of his own, often in teams towards the bottom end of the table. The son of a country football legend, Lockett debuted for the Saints as a powerfully built 17-year-old in 1983. And by 1987, he was an irresistible force. 117 goals and the first man in history to win both the Coleman and Brownlow medals in the one season. He would go on to kick almost 900 goals for the Saints, before heading north to Sydney in 1995 to add another 460 to his collection. Will he write his name in the record book? Forever, Come on, with this kick, it's going to go! Got it! It's it's got it! It's done. It's done. Ah, and aren't we privileged? By the time he had hung up his boots midway through 2002, Tony Lockett had booted a record 1,360 goals, the greatest individual goal kicker in the history of the game. If your team wasn't playing plugger, you would watch the game because you're hoping plugger would either kick 12 or belt someone. Right, or either both. That's what happened. He was like the quintessential train wreck. You think, God, this guy, he's going about 180 miles an hour, he's going to kill someone. And he nearly did a couple of times. 
But how dominant was he? How dominant? While Jason Dunstall and Tony Lockett were the standout orthodox full forwards of the 80s and 90s, there was another prodigious goal kicker who was anything but orthodox. Gary Ablett's enigmatic ways didn't fit the Hawthorne mould, so he was cut loose by the Hawks after just six games in 1982. But the Cats persisted with this mercurial talent, and Ablett rewarded them with some of the most scintillating football ever played. Here is the magician at work. He shoots towards goal. What more can you say? He had all the tricks. Brilliant in the air, unstoppable on the ground, and capable of making the impossible possible with the greatest of ease. Despite starting his career as a wing half forward, Gary Ablett booted 1,030 goals in his 248 game career and provided us with some of the most breathtaking memories of all time. In pure talent terms, the best player that I've ever seen. He could do more things on the football field than anyone I've ever seen. The way he marked, the way he kicked on his left and right foot from any angle, the way he busted packs. You know, I mean, Ablett had the lot. He could dribble them, he could screw them over his head from 50. Gary Ablett seen as the most talented football I've seen by a country mile. While Gary Ablett was affectionately referred to by Geelong fans as God, there was only one king. North Melbourne superstar Wayne Carey. Little give was OK to Bell, who found some space. Kicks wide, wants Carey, running onto it, he's got it. Now he might be a metre or two too far out. He's going to wind himself up and go for it. Carey lets loose. It's a big one. It's a beauty. A powerful athletic centre-half forward, Carey led the Kangaroos into seven consecutive preliminary finals during the 90s. The skipper leading from the front time and again. Wayne Carey might be the first you'd pick because of his physical size and where he plays on the ground, centre-half forward. Carey, to me, was a guy that turned more football games than anyone else that I'd seen play it. I mean, it was just... I've always used this uh, metaphor for Wayne. It was just like the kid from grade six going down to play with the kids in grade three. And just when he wanted to take a mark, he did, or he wanted to kick a goal, or wanted to show off, he could do that. One of those matches was last week in the Classic against uh, the Bulldogs. Kerry comes from the back, Kerry does well. Kerry hooks it back, Kerry kicks a goal! What a match he's having! His controversial departure from Arden Street at the beginning of the 2002 season was one of the biggest stories in football history. The future of the North Melbourne Footy Club hung on Wayne Carey's anterior, anterior cruciate ligament during the 90s. He was that important to this footy team. The North Place loved him. They would have followed him to the end of the earth. Carey was making a comeback. He was coming back into town, the sheriff, and there was a couple of people to welcome him. And that night, the feeling at, at Tulsa Dome was, it was out of this world. A minute or so later, Glenn Archer came over and paid his respects. I can't remember ever going to a game of footy and having a sense of anticipation of what is going to happen here. Here's Carey. Oh, and Stevens lined him up too. And you'll watch the game. But you'd always go back behind play just to see if maybe Glenn Archer's walked up and just killed Wayne Carey. And when they finally all met up... I don't know who's kicked the goal, to be honest, Dermot. I've been watching the well, other Harding end. Harding got it, I think. Harding got it. Right Harding have, a have a look at this. Have a look at this. Have a look at this, boys. You know, it was, it was an unbelievable night, a un truly unbelievable night. AFL Team of the Century centre-half forward Royce Hart debuted for Richmond in the opening round of 1967 and was widely acclaimed as one of the recruits of the year, starring in the Tigers' famous Premiership win. He was mobile, athletic, a brilliant mark and penetrating left foot kick. Coach Tommy Hafey built a simple game plan for his team. Just kick it to Royce and then get out of his way. It worked. The Tigers enjoying their greatest era as Hart led his team to flags in 1967, 69, 73 and 74. Matthew Lloyd is the standout full forward of the current day, racking up bags of goals for the Bombers since his 1995 debut. He has surpassed the great Simon Madden as the most prolific Essendon goal kicker of all time and is the only current day player likely to challenge the 1,000 goal mark. But not all our legendary goal kickers have been key forwards. Lee Matthews debuted for Hawthorne as a 17-year-old and his powerful frame quickly saw him develop into a handful for his smaller opponents. He was deadly around goals, capable of smashing through packs or playing as a leading forward in his own right, earning himself the moniker Lethal Lee. Matthews starred in Hawthorne's golden era of the 70s and 80s, winning eight best and fairests and four premierships booting a remarkable 915 goals along the way. Considered by many to be the greatest player of all time, 
Lee Matthews went on to become one of the great coaches as well, leading Collingwood out of the wilderness to claim the 1990 Premiership before guiding the Brisbane Lions to a hat-trick of titles in 2001 to 2003. I think Lee Matthews encompassed everything. He played in finals and played unbelievably well in finals. He won eight club best and fairest. He played over 300 games. I've always regarded uh, Wayne Carey as the best player that I've ever seen play the game. But when you look at the Matthews record, I think Matthews has got the best record of anyone who have ever played the game. If the ball was there, he was going to get the ball no matter who else came near him. So he had the brilliance and he had the hunger. He, he combined the two at a level no other player in my lifetime has combined it. He didn't have quiet games. His, his quiet game was 13 kicks, two goals and knocking someone out from the opposition. Richmond's Kevin Bartlett was another rover capable of tearing opposition defences apart with freakish anticipation and boundless skill. Bartlett was at the forefront of Richmond's emergence from the wilderness in the mid-60s, playing in five Tiger Premierships in a remarkable 403-game career, collecting the 1980 Norm Smith medal for his brilliant seven-goal performance in Richmond's record-breaking win. I mean, he was a freak, and he roved, and he was selfish, and what a great nickname, Hungry. I mean, how, who gets a nickname Hungry because he didn't handle? No one could ever lay a hand on Kevin Bartlett. Probably the most evasive player I think I've seen him. One of my earliest memories in footy was watching KB run around the boundary line and kick goals. No one else could do that. When you think of ball control, you think of St Kilda's Daryl Baldock. Despite standing just 179 centimetres or 5 foot 10 and a half, Baldock held down centre-half forward for the Saints throughout most of the 1960s, skippering the club to its one and only premiership in 1966. His courage was legendary, as were his ball skills at ground level. The Doc mesmerising opponents and fans alike as he weaved his magic. And Ian Stewart, who played with him and won two Brownlow medals, has always said that Baldock's the best player he played with. Play on his call by umpire Shields as the ball is kicked back by Gary Crane. And Jezzelenko has done it again! Oh, Carlton again. superstar Alex Jezelenko rocketed onto the VFL scene upon his arrival from Canberra in 1967. With a Ukrainian father and a Russian mother, Jezza hadn't picked up an Australian football until the age of 14. But by 22, he'd finished third in the Brownlow medal in his first season. He would play in four premierships with the Blues, a footballing wizard with freakish ball skills, remarkable balance and a breathtaking leap. Okay. To the wing position on the member stand side. Oh, Jezelenko, you beauty! Jezelenko, you beauty. <laughs> Mike Williamson, that's to me probably the greatest catch cry in football. You talk to Carlton supporters about Jezza. Jezza was like God. Jezza was just beyond his years. He kicked 100 goals at full forward, the only Carlton player to do so. He played, he won a best and fairest on a half back flank where his tackling was just unbelievable. But probably the thing about him was his balance. He never fell over, he just kept his foot in. Four men have won the game's greatest individual honour on three occasions. Footy's triple Brownlow medalists. Dick Reynolds is widely regarded as the greatest bomber of all time. 320 games, seven best and fairests, and Brownlow medals in 1934, 37 and 38. He combined with fellow Hall of Famer Bill Hutchison to create an unbeatable roving duo for the Dons. King Dick also went on to coach Essendon for 22 seasons between 1939 and 1960. A remarkable 415 games in charge for four premierships as captain coach. Hayden Bunton's trophy cabinet is as full as any player to have pulled on a boot. Debuting for Fitzroy as a 19-year-old, he won the Brownlow medal in his first two seasons of league football, then finished runner-up before winning it again in 1935. Bunton crossed to Subiaco in 1938 and won three Sandover medals as WA's fairest and best in 1938, 39 and 41. Arguably the greatest sentiment of all time, Ian Stewart shocked the football world when he won the 1965 Brownlow medal. But it was no surprise when he backed it up again 12 months later. He crossed to Richmond in a sensational swap for Billy Barrett at the end of 1970. It proved to be a masterstroke, with the rejuvenated Stewart winning his third Brownlow medal in his first season with the Tigers. Bob Skilton grew up dreaming of playing for his local team, Port Melbourne. 
but it was with South Melbourne that he made his name as a football legend. Debuting as a 17-year-old in 1956, he would win South's best and fairest in incredible nine times in 11 seasons. A rover as courageous and skillful as any before or since, Skilton never took his eye off the ball and often suffered the consequences. Blessed with brilliant skills on both sides of his body, he was a player ahead of his time, winning the Brownlow medal in 1959, 63 and 68. Tough, brave. In an era when, when, you could, when the good players did get knocked around, particularly if they were small, I mean, he just got knocked down time after time and kept getting up and kept playing well. All champions share two common qualities, above average natural talent and an exceptional drive and work ethic to get the most out of themselves. From there, it's up to their own individual strengths to provide the competitive edge, as we've seen in our modern day stars with the grace and poise of James Hurd, the courage and ferocity of Glenn Archer, the precision and commitment of Nathan Buckley, the endless run of Craig Bradley and Robert Harvey, the athleticism and power of Anthony Kutafidis and Adam Goods. The explosive speed and balance of Chris Judd. Once a champion, always a champion. And our game has had plenty to celebrate and enjoy. This year, you know, we've had Nathan Buckley go, we've had Mark Rashido go, we've had James Hurd go. Everyone's going, who's going to replace these people? They will be replaced. That's what footy's good. There's someone in there who's someone who's grade six at Shepherd and High or Shepherd and Primary School. He could be the next James Hurd in 10 years. And footy has shown us that superstars, they come and they go, but they leave their mark. Sport has always provided us with the highest of human drama and for 150 years Australian football has been no exception. Amidst the hustle and bustle of footy occasionally come moments that stand frozen in time. Split seconds immortalised by Herald Sun photographers for all eternity. These are the moments that create the fabric of our game. The famous incidents, exchanges and stories that will live on forever in folklore and on film. These are Footy's Magic Memories. When the seemingly invincible Ted Whitten contracted prostate cancer, most believed that the legend of the Western suburbs would steamroll straight over the top of it like he did everything else in his life. But this was one opponent that EJ would not be able to get the better of and by mid-1995, he was gravely ill. With his beloved Vicks set to host South Australia at the MCG, what better stage for the football world to say goodbye to Mr Football? The result was arguably our game's most magical moment. It was um, the most emotional moment that I've seen at the football. There have been lots of highlights at the football, but I think we're all sons, husbands, wives, daughters, and that family aspect there of... Um, Young Ted cradling his father and, and you could see that te the Ted Senior was dying and that uh, I'll never forget that moment at the MCG. Just the strength he showed, the love to his son, he had his grandchildren in the car with him and everyone there was on his side, yet uh, all he wanted us to do was stick it up him. I went to see him six weeks before he died uh, out at his home near Footscray where he played all his footy. I went with Mike Sheehan, Trevor Grant, two Herald Sun journalists and Bill Cannon. So it was, and he had, at that stage, he'd lost his sight, he'd had a stroke. But as we walked in, he, we introduced ourselves and he threw his arm around us and shook hands. The, the grip was still the same. We went out, sat in his kitchen, 
uh, talk, talked about Gary Ablett, talked about football. And um, I'm going to struggle with this, but the moment when we left and just the big hug from EJ and he knew it was, that was the last time that we'd see each other. Um, and I just never forget when I said, we've got to go. And it was, I think, momentarily he'd forgotten where he was at in his life and he was just reliving the memories and he was as bold as ever. And I said, EJ, we've got to go, mate. And with all the little strength that he had left, he mustered that and he says, right out then, piss off. And that was just Witten, you know. I mean, even at that point, um, it wasn't the softness about him, it was just the bravado. And it was just a very moving occasion for all of us who were there. There was no fear. He was facing death as he faced an opponent on the football field, head on. Our game's most touching human story is that of Hawthorne skipper Peter Crimmins. The little fella, as he was affectionately known, contracted testicular cancer during the 1974 season, then suffered a relapse early in 1975. He underwent a brutal course of chemotherapy, then amazed doctors by returning to training in order to lead his team come September. With one reserves game under his belt, the Hawthorne Selection Committee faced the agonising decision of whether to pick Crimo for the 1975 Grand Final. In the end, coach John Kennedy elected not to risk the health of their little captain. Crimmins devastated upon being left out of the side that is belted by North Melbourne. He absorbed the crushing disappointment and returned to the fold, only for the cancer to return even more aggressively than before. And by grand final day 1976, Crimmins was critically ill. Typically, he had hung on to support his teammates, who, inspired by their captain's brave fight, steamrolled North Melbourne to claim the 1976 Premiership. Hawthorne won that grand final. They're never going to lose it, because people like Peter Knights loved Peter Crimmins with a passion. And that North Melbourne side that played Hawthorne in 1976 was, had never had a hope of winning the game. Half a dozen teammates broke away from the post-match celebrations to share the moment with their dying skipper. Peter Crimmins lying in bed, um, look, you know, seven and a half stone. Uh, days from death and his mates are around him holding a cup so um, that's as emotional pictures I've ever seen. Then little more than 48 hours later he was gone taken cruelly by cancer just seven weeks after his 28th birthday. When the dreaded call to arms has echoed out across Australia over the years Australian footballers have always been quick to respond. Some 143 league players have made the ultimate sacrifice for their country, including stars such as Len Thomas, Jim Park and Ron Barassi Sr., the first VFL player killed in action in World War II. Keith Bluey Truscott was a teammate of Barassi's in Melbourne's 1940 Premiership win, before departing for Britain, where he made a name for himself as an ace fighter pilot who shot down 15 German aircraft in deadly dogfights over the English Channel. He returned to Australia after being downed himself in 1942 and led Melbourne out against Richmond in their round two game at Punt Road. It was a welcome piece of good news as the game struggled along under the demands of World War II. Truscott would be tragically killed on a target practice exercise in Western Australia just 10 months later. The Dees paying tribute to their war hero by naming the club's best and fairest medal in his honour. Jason McCartney had played 181 AFL games for Collingwood, Adelaide and the Kangaroos when he headed to Bali for a well-earned post-season holiday in October of 2002. In one horrific instant, his life was in the balance as the bar in which he was relaxing was blown apart by the infamous Bali bombing terrorist attack. 202 people were killed, including 88 Australians. McCartney suffering severe second-degree burns to more than 50% of his body. Despite his injuries, he focused on assisting others around him. McCartney's condition rapidly deteriorating to the point where he almost lost his life whilst undergoing surgery. He set himself two goals, to marry his fiancée Nerissa and to get back to play AFL football, a task the medicos thought impossible. He eventually returned to full training wearing heavy bandages and gloves to protect his delicate skin and by round 11 of 2003, he was ready for his return. It was an unforgettable night. Inspired by bomb victims and their families in the crowd, McCartney marked and gold with the game in the balance in the final quarter. 
He then set up the winning goal, his beloved Kangaroos home by three points. McCartney then stunned the football world by announcing his immediate retirement. I find it fitting now that I'll uh, hang the boots up as of tonight and go out on a great note. Because I'm spent, it's been a tough time, but that's enough for me, mate. Because he, he was a somebody in a, in a horrible world, he actually became I don't know, a figure of the bomb and, and about fighting back and, and, and surviving and moving on. It was just such an uplifting thing, not just for the families of those victims, but for we who are watching it and thinking to those bombers who tried to send a message, Jason McCartney sent a message back to you and stuff you. It was more than a footy moment, it was like an Australian life event or Australian sporting life event, if that makes sense. It was, it was an amazing night. Australian football has made an enormous social contribution over the years, leading the way on issues such as racial and religious vilification. Once the sole domain of Anglo-Saxon footballers, the AFL has become a source of great opportunity for young Indigenous players. And recognition must be given to the Trailblazers, whose persistence, vision and resilience paved the way for those who have followed and enhanced our game accordingly. Douglas Nichols, Norm Macdonald, Sid Jackson, Polly Farmer, Barry Cable, the Cracker Brothers. They all played significant roles in breaking down footy's racial barriers. But it was two men in the 1990s who directly exposed and rejected racial vilification in our game once and for all. Things that had been part of the culture for so long, suddenly Michael Long brought them to a head. Um, sanity prevailed, we all realised it was unfair that people should be vilified on the grounds of race on the football field. Michael Long was a statesman for the game, where he actually stood up and said, I'm proud of my colour. Nicky Widmer, of course, lifted his jumper at uh, Victoria Park that day and pointed to his colour. Here I am, I'm good, I'm bold, I'm brave. I'm standing here in front of you in what was probably the most hostile territory in football at the time, at Vic Park, and there it was with the jumper up, magnificent body, the black skin, the finger. I just look back at it now and think it's amazing how quickly things move forward from there. Another who has made a significant contribution to the growth and development of the Indigenous influence on our game is super coach Kevin Sheedy. His vision is matched only by his passion, as evidenced on one now famous afternoon in mid-1993 after his baby bombers rolled reigning Premier's West Coast at the MCG. In a spur-of-the-moment action, Sheeds inadvertently created a new footy tradition that will live on forever between Essendon and West Coast. Sheedy was also close by for another of footy's most famous moments, when Big Nick was flattened by Richmond's Laurie Fowler just three minutes into the 1973 Grand Final. When Nick hit the MCG turf, I think the hearts of many Carlton supporters went with him and Richmond players just lifted and so the crowd lift. I reckon everyone in the Carlton team and, and all the Carlton supporters didn't think they could win the game of football after Nick hit the deck. That's just how important he was to this footy team. With Carlton's captain coach and team enforcer effectively out of the contest, the Tigers took liberties with other Blues. Neil Baum taking star fullback Jeff Southby out of commission as Richmond muscled their way to the 1973 title. Sweet revenge for their Nichols orchestrated grand final defeat the previous season. These two great rivals were also bit players in another famous MCG moment. It was August 27, 1999. Richmond set to host Carlton on Friday night football. But the most dramatic action of the night occurred well before the opening bounce. I looked up to the scoreboard and then something caught my eye and in the bottom left hand corner there was just a little flicker. And I said, hey, hey, there's one of the, a couple of the light blades were blown, they're, they're on fire. We started looking at it and in the space of about five minutes, it grew and grew and grew, and but then it got scary. Then I thought, well, is it going to tumble down? I mean, are people going to die? And the Herald Sun the next day, it was a front page photo, yeah, the MCG, I lied, but it went from a moment of, oh, geez, the scoreboard's on fire, to, geez, I hope, I hope, I hope it doesn't fall down. But just let's hope that it can be controlled and there's nothing that is explosive inside there now. Uh, the fire brigade are getting things under control. The most emotion charged match in the MCG's proud history was the round 22 1996 merger clash between Hawthorne and Melbourne. With the two clubs set to face a merger vote in a matter of weeks, fate had them meet each other in the final round of the season. That would be one of the three uh, most memorable games I've seen. I remember walking across to go to the MCG that night thinking there might be 25 or 28,000 people there. I think there were close to 70, I think. Uh, 
an amazing game of football, the, the passion that night. And then uh, Dunstall uh, kicked his 100th goal that night. And David Needs kicked nine. And, 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 and Chris Langford came off peeling the Hawthorne jumper off. It was, look, it was an unforgettable night. It, it, uh, again, it was that passion. I think people sort of saying, I think even the message that night was we'd rather die than actually give up our jumper. The Hawks prevailed in a one-point thriller to scrape into the 1996 finals. But the real battle for these two clubs lay just around the corner. Hawthorne was in dire financial straits and saw a merger with Melbourne as the lifeline they needed to survive. Melbourne was financially more viable, but lacked on-field success and a genuine home base for social, administrative and training purposes. The Melbourne Hawks merger proposal was put to the members on September 16, 1996. After bitter debate, Melbourne's members voted in favour of the merger. But when the Hawthorne rank and file overwhelmingly rejected the deal following passionate pleas from club legends including Don Scott, the merger was sunk and both clubs lived to fight another day. So many people who genuinely cared and who were making decisions from their heart in what they thought were the best interests of their footy clubs were disenfranchised by their footy clubs when things didn't eventuate, when the merger didn't happen. It just hurt so many people, so many good people who'd given so much to their footy clubs and they never ever felt welcome back there after the things that were done and said at that time. Footy has given us so many magical moments and none more so than those fairy tale grand final day stories. Footscray's breakthrough win in 1954, Hawthorne's first flag in 1961, St Kilda's unforgettable 1966 triumph, North Melbourne's 1975 glory, Collingwood burying the Collywobbles in 1990, West Coast's historic 1992 conquest, Adelaide's against the odds win in 1997, Port Adelaide ending the Lions run in 2004. Sydney ending their 72 year drought in 2005. Geelong's record breaking demolition in 2007. All have taken their place in footy folklore with their joy and excitement to live in the hearts of their loyal fans forevermore. For all our magical memories, there's nothing quite as magical as seeing your team Capture Footy's Holy Grail. The Wayne Carey Anthony Stevens affair at North Melbourne, when that broke, the next day, the Herald Sun's first 14 pages were on that issue. 14 pages of the newspaper. We copped a lot of criticism over that. How can you devote so much aid to two footballers or, or to one footballer in his transgression? The, the paper sold an extra 60,000 copies. It was as if the public couldn't get enough of it anyway. I don't know the balance. Sometimes do we force feed the public or do the public get what they want? In Melbourne, there's simply no bigger story than a big footy story. For 150 years, our game has dominated the front and back pages of the Herald Sun. The public's appetite for the latest footy bombshell has never waned. And be it a crucial injury, a boardroom brawl, a human interest story or a controversial suspension, we as footy fans love to read all about it. And speaking of suspensions, there have been few more dramatic or costly than that of Essendon superstar John Coleman on the eve of the 1951 finals. Coleman had been reported for striking Carlton fullback Harry Casper in the final round of the home and away season. With the Bombers gunning for their third consecutive premiership, hundreds of fans waited anxiously outside Harrison House for the tribunal verdict. Despite the umpires conceding Coleman was provoked by Casper, he was found guilty of striking and suspended for four weeks. The Dons, without their superstar spearhead, ultimately falling to Geelong by 11 points on grand final day. Fast forward 26 years and it was Collingwood fans sweating on a September report. Fiery superstar Phil Carmen was the Magpies trump card in their bid to bury the Collie Wobbles once and for all. An athletic centre-half forward, he was unstoppable on his day, but had been reported for striking Hawthorne's Michael Tuck in Collingwood's 1977 second semi-final win. Fabulous Phil would be suspended for two weeks, ruling the game's number one player out of the grand final and the subsequent grand final replay. Carmen was also at the centre of a firestorm three years later, when, in a moment of madness, he headbutted boundary umpire Graham Carberry during Essendon's round four game against St Kilda at Moorabbin. Talking, oh, did you see that one? 
Did you see that one? Carmen was suspended for a total of 20 weeks. Four for striking St Kilda's Gary Sidebottom and 16 for headbutting Carberry. Quite possibly the single biggest football story of all time came midway through 1965, when Melbourne supercoach Norm Smith was inexplicably sacked. Smith had overseen the Demons' greatest era, leading the club into eight grand finals for six premierships in just 11 years. But a libel suit lodged against Smith after he criticised an umpire caused a falling out between the coach and the board. Suddenly and without warning, Smith was given his marching orders. The football world was stunned. They'd played 11 games Melbourne that year. They'd won the premiership the year before. So he's coming out for a premiership year. After eight rounds, they're undefeated. Undefeated. I mean, get your head around that. After 11 rounds, they're nine, nine and two. They've lost two games for the year. And they've won nine and they sack him. The Norse of sacking was just an error of judgment by a snooty committee at the time. What sort of buffoon would make that decision? Of course, common sense prevailed and later on they brought him back. But the spirit had gone. Melbourne had been broken as a footy club. Brassie had gone and then Smith was effectively gone from that time on and he knew it himself that it was all over. That was the silliest decisions by administrators in the history of the game. When talented South Australian utility Neil Saxe ran out onto the Western Oval for Footscray's Round 2 1975 clash against Fitzroy, little did he know that he was about to make a very unwanted piece of VFL history. In just his second league game, Saxe would become the first player rendered a quadriplegic from an on-field incident. This seemingly innocuous collision with Fitzroy's Kevin O'Keefe severely damaging Neil's spinal cord and breaking his neck. He would never walk again. Fast forward 12 years to 1987, and brilliant young Carlton star Peter Motley is critically injured in a horrific car accident on his way home from training. Motley was driving innocently down Queen's Parade in Clifton Hill when an out of control car launched over the tram tracks and came crashing down on top of him. Given a less than 30% chance of surviving the night, Motley defied the odds and lived, but would never play football again. You speak to Craig Bradley and Stephen Kernahan, whose records are fairly handy, and they'll both tell you that Motley's as good a player as they've seen in South Australian football. And for him to be struck down after just one year with a car accident, that's a case of what might have been. Collingwood's Darren Mullane was another AFL star who made front page headlines for a tragic reason. Mullane was a big, strong, fearless wingman in Collingwood's rise to prominence in the late 80s and early 90s and, as a lovable rogue both on and off the field, was a favourite son of the Magpie Army. He was a gun. He was a gun footballer. He was as tough... He was as tough a player I've seen play footy. The last round of the 1990 season, he broke his thumb at Victoria Park playing against Fitzroy and was told, then you won't play in the finals. Mullane said, I'm playing the finals. Uh, what do I have to do to get through the finals? And they said, we have to wear your thumb in a in plaster all through the week, and then it'll be taken off before the game. I went into the Collingwood rooms after their first final, and which was out at Waverley, I think, against the West Coast Eagles in a drawn game. He got in the shower, the plaster came off his hand, and the pain of the water hitting his thumb caused him to scream out in agony. Now, he was a seriously tough guy, Darren Malone, so that gave you some idea of what he was going through. I think that was felt by all the other players, and that, that galvanised that team. Yeah, the 1990 Premiership player who held the ball in his hands when the siren sounded, he had the ball in his hands and he threw it up. It was to know. He played the next year, then he died in October, early October 1991, driving from the Tunnel nightclub at 3.30am in the morning. Uh, well over the limit, as we well know, he made a, a fatal error in judgement. It was one of the saddest things to happen in footy, and and Darren Mullane's number, number 42, is still cherished at the Collingwood Football Club. There are 8,000 people down in Dandenong at his service. And, um, yeah, I, look, I think that's still felt. I mean, I reckon it set Collingwood back that for the next decade. They didn't recover from Mullane. He was the spiritual person of that club for that period. Another story guaranteed to spark mass interest from the football public is anything to do with club relocations or mergers, as first seen in late 1981 when the struggling South Melbourne was shipped off to Sydney. It created a bitter division within the cash-strapped club, which simply couldn't meet its crippling debts. The Sydney Swans struggled through their first couple of seasons in the Harbour City, before private ownership in 1986 suddenly saw an on-field surge into Premiership contention as new coach Tom Hafey was joined by star recruits such as Greg Williams, Jared Healy and Merv Nagel. 
With flamboyant full forward Warwick Kappa kicking bags of goals, the Swans became the glamour team of the competition, but fell short in the 1986 and 87 final series before Westec, the club's parent company, ran out of money. The Swans would plummet into a black hole on and off the field, narrowly avoiding extinction on a number of occasions before it ultimately returned to a membership-based club in 1993. Led by Chairman Richard Collis, the Bloods gradually clawed their way back to strength allowing our game to maintain its all-important presence in Australia's largest city. The Footscray Football Club was another facing extinction in the late 1980s. The Doggies facing little choice but to merge with Fitzroy or die in October 1989. But the power of the people rallied like our game had never seen before. The masses mobilised in an enormous Save the Dogs campaign. Thousands of footy fans pounded the pavement, rattling tins and tirelessly door knocking for every single dollar that could be spared. In the end, Save the Dogs raised a remarkable $1.5 million in just 19 days. The doggies surviving the hangman's noose in a timely reminder that our game is truly the people's game. That merge was heavily weighted towards Fitzroy and uh, Footscray incredibly wasn't going to get a lot out of it. And uh, it took people like Peter Gord and it took the Footscray people to rattle those cans and get the whole thing going. Ross Oakley was seen as the public face, I think unfairly to Ross Oakley. I think he's, you look back on Ross's tenure and you'd say he actually did a very good job, but he had the um, car stickers saying up yours Oakley. And there was real hatred out there in the, uh, in the streets directed towards him. And the people did take over and they, uh, they had a win. While the Bulldogs were rejuvenated by their 1989 near-death experience, the same could not be said for their proposed merger partner, Fitzroy. The Lions found the going increasingly difficult through the early 90s with dwindling revenue and spiralling debt. They didn't have a home, didn't have a training base. There wasn't the white knight that other clubs may have got uh, or the support base to give them that chance to survive. By late June of 1996, Fitzroy was on its last financial legs. The AFL stepped in to guarantee funds to ensure the club could see out the season and merger discussions were well underway with North Melbourne. But North were an on-field powerhouse who would ultimately go on to win the Premiership that year, and other AFL clubs were fearful of the creation of a super team should the proposed merger be passed. Instead, they approved an 11th-hour approach from the lowly Brisbane Bears, and on July 4, 1996, the Brisbane Lions were born. I think that would have been a much cleaner, uh, more satisfying way for it to finish, but they're resilient gr groups, football clubs, and I don't think anyone's ever going to put their hand up and, and, and want to be seen to be the person that said, I brought my football club down and sent it into state, and that's why it never happened. And I guess it, it wasn't a total surprise when they went. Uh, I was, it was very sad that they went the way they did. Fitzroy's last game in Melbourne was at the MCG against Richmond in round 21, 1996. The biggest crowd the Roys had seen in more than three and a half years, almost 50,000 fans turned up to say goodbye. They witnessed the grim spectacle of the Lions being torn apart by 151 points. But that pain was nothing in comparison to thousands of broken Fitzroy hearts. That game against Richmond was just sad. It was terribly sad to watch that. But for those people that really cared, and I've got quite a few of my friends that are passionate Fitzroy people, and the wounds are still there. I mean, I think it was just sort of this public... They just, they just died in public, didn't they? But they went over playing Fremantle at Subiaco Oval in front of a you know, crowd of seven, 8,000 people. They were undeserving. That was that the AFL should have made that game be played in Melbourne and give those Fitzroy people the chance to send off their club. The end of an era, the end of an age for Fitzroy. Go and talk to somebody who barracks for that football club and get them to tell you what it's like to not have your football club playing AFL anymore. The support of your own club, you can't imagine what it'd be like for that club to be shipped into state. Uh, I guess you get something if you follow them. Be better than nothing, do you, don't you? But I, I feel for Fitzroy people. You feel for any club that um, is forced into oblivion. I know, I know a lot of Fitzroy supporters and some don't go to the footy anymore. Some still do and some have adopted the Brisbane Lions. But it's not the same. It's not the same. The Brisbane Lions of the early 21st century would go on to become one of the greatest teams our game has ever known. Ironically, it was the fear of creating a super team that had led to Fitzroy and Brisbane's shotgun wedding in the first place. The Lions claimed a hat-trick of premierships from 2001 to 2003. Unthinkable glory within just five years of their arranged marriage. 
Whilst nothing can fully compensate for the loss of Fitzroy's independent identity, that long-awaited success was enough to bring a substantial number of disenfranchised Fitzroy fans back to our game. Our great game of footy is an emotional roller coaster. The unbearable tension of a tight finish. The jubilation or despair when that final siren suddenly blares. The miracle comeback. The against all odds upset. The piece of individual magic that turns the tide and changes an entire result. Our game has had them all. <laughs> Having finished three games clear on top of the ladder, Melbourne entered the 1958 Grand Final as unbackable favourites to win their fourth consecutive flag and equal Collingwood's 1927-30 Premiership record. Standing in their way were the Magpies themselves, the Demons' greatest arch-rival determined to protect their precious piece of history. The scene was a wet, muddy MCG, conditions that played into Collingwood's hands. Having been belted by Melbourne to the tune of 45 points in the second semi a fortnight earlier, the Magpies changed tack, instead turning the Premiership decider into a hard, tough, knock -em down affair. Black and white enforcers Hooker Harrison and Murray Wiedemann did their job, unsettling Demon stars such as Ron Barassi with their vigorous and aggressive style of play that drew Melbourne into retaliating and playing the man themselves. The result was one of the great upsets in grand final history. Collingwood claiming the 1958 flag with an 18-point win to deny the Ds their precious four in a row. It was to be the Magpie Army's last taste of Premiership success for quite some time. Melbourne exacted a measure of Grand Final Day revenge two years later, when they held the Pies to just two goals in a soggy 1960 Grand Final, then really rubbed it in four years later when they claimed the 1964 flag. The Ds home by just four points. But the Magpies continued to press for Premiership number 14, finishing one game clear on top of the table in 1966, then winning through to the big one with a 10-point victory over St Kilda in the second semi-final. Alan Jeans' Saints were hell-bent on winning their first ever Premiership, having fallen to Essendon the previous season. And they swept the Dons aside on preliminary final day of 1966 to earn a rematch with Collingwood on that last Saturday in September. The result was one of the most memorable grand finals in history. With scores levelled deep into time on in the final term, the stage was set for a hero. That man turned out to be 18-year-old Saint Barry Breen. That's a point. That's a point. They have been playing. If my hand will stop shaking, I can see the watch. Hit the boundary line. 28 and a half gone. There's Murray's kick to the wing position on the outer side. There's the siren. Baldock up there. What a magnificent skipper's game he played. Well done, fellas. What a game. The following year's Premiership decider turned out to be another classic. Tommy Hafey's Tigers had emerged from 23 years in the wilderness to claim the 1967 minor Premiership. Thanks largely to the emergence of young stars such as Royce Hart, Kevin Bartlett and Francis Burke. They swept through to grand final day with an emphatic 40-point win over Carlton then prepared to face Peter Pianto's Geelong for the 67 flag. Not to be intimidated, the Cats, led by stars such as Polly Farmer, Doug Wade, Dennis Marshall and Bill Goggin, surfed it up to the Tigers all afternoon in a hectic, fast-paced shootout. I went to the game as a kid. I'd only been to three games before that live because I grew up in the bush and three hours to get to Melbourne. There they go, Ronaldson and Mitchell. Neither gets a clear tap down. Ainsworth tries to kick off the ground. In they come, Bartlett's here. He backs out of the pack. He steadies. What a throw. There was a couple of contentious decisions and then John Ronaldson comes on and kicks two drop kick goals from 60 metres out. I mean, John Ronaldson couldn't do that at any other time in his life. Here's a go for Polinelli. Polinelli picks up. He tries a long one. A heart-stopping finale to an all-time classic. Richmond claiming their first premiership in almost a quarter of a century with a thrilling nine-point win. I was glad to go into the rooms with a bloke called Dr Ryan, who was the club doctor at Geelong at the time after the match. I remember a couple of players were crying, a few had a couple of beers. 
the enormity of losing that game to Richmond, and that Geelong side was just a brilliant side. The 1970 grand final saw bitter rivals Carlton and Collingwood square off in front of the largest crowd in football history. An incredible 121,696 squeezed into the MCG to see whether the Magpies could break their run of narrow grand final failures by repeating their second semi-final win over the Blues a fortnight earlier. Led by stars such as Peter McKenna, Len Thompson and Des Tudnam, the Pies blew Carlton off the park in the first half to lead by a whopping 44 points at half-time. Faced with a seemingly insurmountable deficit, Carlton coach Ron Barassi implored his team to throw caution to the wind, to play on and handball at every opportunity, thereby changing the flow of the game. He also went with his gut instinct, replacing Bert Thornley with goal sneak Ted Hopkins. For Barassi to do what he did and tell the players to take risks, tells you a lot about Barassi. I'm not sure Tommy Hafey, as coach of Richmond, would have done that. Uh, in fact, I'm darn sure he wouldn't have done that. I'm not sure Bob Rose, who was coach of Collingwood in that game, would have done that. It's not been critical of either of those coaches. Barassi had that little bit extra, that bit of flair. Malcolm Blight would have done it. The second half of the 1970 grand final is etched in stone as footy legend. Hopkins bobbed up with a couple of quick goals. The Blues turning the game on its head with seven goals in 12 minutes at the beginning of the third term. Nightmares of September's past came back to haunt the Magpie Army as Carlton slammed on another five goals to one in the final term to steal the most famous of grand final victories by 10 points. It's the most exciting grand final because they came from behind. I think it changed footy in many ways. The 1971 grand final therefore had a lot to live up to. But it too turned out to be one of the most dramatic matches of all time. John Kennedy's Hawthorne faced Alan Jeans' Saints in front of more than 118,000. Hawthorne superstar Peter Hudson entered the game needing four goals to break Bob Pratt's 150 goal season record. His Hawks starting as slight favourites, having beaten St Kilda by two points a fortnight earlier. Hudson was flattened early by Cowboy Neal and wasn't able to exert his usual influence. The Saints turning for home with a 20-point lead. But Hawthorne supercoach John Kennedy had an ace up his sleeve. He moved Hudson out to centre-half forward, shifting regular half-forward Bob Keddy to the goal square. Keddy booted four goals in 16 minutes as the Hawks came storming home with a seven-goal final term. Hudson repeatedly thwarted in his dramatic bid to kick the record-breaking 151st goal. He kicks... God, he's missed it. It was Hawthorne claiming the 1971 Premiership by seven points in another September Classic. Arguably the most dramatic grand final of all time was in 1977. Ron Barassi's North Melbourne head-to-head -head with Collingwood, who, under new coach Tommy Hafey, had jumped from last the previous year to claim the minor Premiership and win straight through to grand final day. Despite the absence of suspended superstar Phil Carmen, the Magpies held their own in the first half before exploding away in the third term to hold a commanding 27-point lead at the final change. Were those dreaded collie wobbles about to be put to rest? All the Magpies thought uh, the drought had broken, particularly a trainer who was uh, waving, uh, waving the towel. And I mean, the, the celebrations came too early. Um, and then Collingwood, there's no doubt that the collie wobbles existed. That was a genuine, accepted medical condition. And it just swept through this team. The Kangaroos came storming home in the final quarter as the Magpies stopped to a walk. The Roos hit the front and led by six points as the ball headed deep into Collingwood's forward line with only moments remaining. There's a mark here to someone. It's in front of Twiggy Dunn. It's a good set. Twiggy Dunn, I think, has got it. Oh, oh golly, it could be a drawn game. Well, oh, the pressure on this veteran from Collingwood played over 200 games. Fires for the goals. And he's put it through and scores at that level. And picked up by Little Bob. He's going for a run. Can you get it down there in time? There's the side, I think, for the end of the game. It's a draw. It's a draw. The 1977 grand final is a draw. Oh, and we'll be back here next week. I remember it vividly. I mean, no one knew what to do because there'd been a, a, a drawn grand final in the late 40s but I mean for most of the people who were at the football that day and certainly the players it was sort of this what's happened where are we what happens from here as soon as the siren went that day I think you had to sit there and say North will win the replay here I think the, the pies I think they'd seen what they thought was their destiny just disappear in front of their eyes
With the suspended Phil Carmen still on the sidelines, Collingwood succumbs North Melbourne in the grand final replay, despite this all-time great running goal by Phil Manassa. The Kangaroos claiming their second league title by a comfortable 27 points. The Collie Wobbles had struck yet again. But to the Magpies' eternal credit, they kept fielding premiership contending teams year after year. And in 1979, they made it through to the last Saturday in September for the sixth time in the 22 seasons since their 1958 flag. This time around, it was their dreaded nemesis of nine years earlier. Arch rival Carlton under captain coach Alex Jezelenko. It was everything you would expect from a Carlton Collingwood decider. Tight, tense and brutal. The Pies were in complete control when they pulled away to a 28-point lead midway through the second term, before young Carlton Dynamo Wayne Harms moved into the centre and sparked the Blues. The favourite slammed on five goals in 12 minutes to lead by a point at the major break, before opening up a handy 21-point advantage by three-quarter time. Once again, Collingwood's premiership dreams looked to be on shaky ground. But the Pies rallied magnificently in the final term to get themselves back into the contest. That's slamming goal! It would take arguably the most famous moment in grand final history to deny the Magpie Army yet again. Harms fires at the goals, but he's off target. It's rolling towards the boundary line, and Harms almost makes ground. He tips it back to Sheldon, and it's a goal! Was it out? God, who knows? You know, if it was the beauty of it today, with, with the amount of cameras at footy games now, we would know whether it was in or out. Wayne Harms tapping it back to um, Kenny Sheldon, who picked it up in goal. The difference was, I think, five points at the end of the game on a soggy MCG day. It was one of the MCG grand final moments of all time. That'll still be shown in 100 years' time when we're all dead and buried. Hawthorne and Essendon emerged as footy's great rivalry of the early 80s. Two hungry up-and-coming young teams desperate to seize the mantle as the league's new powerhouse club. The result was some ferocious, uncompromising and compelling football for matches to savour. They were like the glory days of footy. Essendon Hawthorne started in about 82. Dipper absolutely, absolutely wiped out Alan Stoneham. Absolutely wiped him out and a big fight started. And that was, that's what started it and Sheedy, Sheedy was into the players. He, he wanted them to beat Hawthorne, but not beat him. He wanted them to hurt them. And to hurt them, he had to play tough. Well, he might have been trying to get square with uh, Stoneham's incident. But Hawthorne had tough men. They had Dermot Breton. I mean, Dermot would stand up to him. He would stand up to anyone, Dermot. Dipper on a wing. You know, Gary Ayres at the back pocket. They were a tough team. But they weren't as tough as Essendon. They weren't. But all through that period of about four or five years, their matches were... They were, they were bloody. They were dirty. You know, they were tough and they were great games of footy because both teams had, you know, champion players playing for them. Hawthorne annihilated Essendon on grand final day 1983, winning by a then record margin of 83 points. And when the Hawks led the Bombers by 23 points at three-quarter time in a low-scoring 1984 grand final, the boys from Glen Ferry Oval appeared all but certain to claim back-to-back -back flags for the first time in club history. But, like Ron Barassi before him, Essendon coach Kevin Sheedy decided to throw caution to the wind and made a series of radical moves that changed the complexion of the game. 1984 was a great grand final because the Bombers came from behind at half-time, well down, and Sheedy changed everything around with the players moving them forward. It takes the coach sometimes to dare to be different. The climax to the 1987 home and away season was the most thrilling in the history of the game. 87, amazing, amazing end to the season. Uh, all positions in the five changed in the last last round. I was at the uh, the Western Oval, now known as the Witten Oval, a little red tranny, and as the match progressed, more and more people came over. Everyone who had a tranny was suddenly important because we were listening to what happened at Geelong and Hawthorne. And when Jason Dunstall kicked the goal to put Hawthorne in front of Geelong, the roar at the Witten Oval was so loud that the players stopped. That's a true story. They thought that the siren sounded, they'd missed it. But it was just that the Melbourne people had realised that Hawthorne's in front, we win this game here, we're, we're in the finals, and that was the first time in the finals for Melbourne since 1964. And then out at Waverley, just uh, probably in, the, in the, uh, the incident that decided the Premiership actually, Stephen Kernahan kicked one of his famous helicopters through. Carlton finished on top and won through to grand final day. But the fairy tale story of September 1987 was Melbourne. 
in their first finals campaign in 23 years. The Dees demolished the Roos by 118 points and then the Swans by 76 points as a real sense of destiny started to permeate through the Melbourne faithful. All that stood between the Demons and their first grand final in a generation was reigning Premier's Hawthorne. More than 71,000 fans flocked to Waverley. The Dees entering as overwhelming sentimental favourites. They kicked with the aid of the wind in the opening three quarters, courtesy of a fluky breeze. And when they turned for home with a 22-point lead, the long-suffering Blue and Red Army could barely contain their excitement. The experienced Hawks turned up the heat in the final term. Melbourne spraying a series of golden opportunities to close out the game as the boys from Glen Ferry edged ever closer. In the end, it came down to one last roll of the dice for Hawthorne. But I've never seen a game change as quickly as that. Straight in, straight to half back mark, kick into uh, to uh, to Bacanara. Then Big Jimmy lopes through the mark, chasing uh, chasing his opponent. The whistle goes, Bacanara goes to about 40, and you knew then. He knew then it was over. I mean, it was a beautiful kick. If he kicks this goal, Hawthorne are in the 1987 Grand Final. If he misses, Melbourne are in. There's the kick. It's a goal. It's a goal. I remember I was sitting with a mate of mine. And we had the picnic basket and everything had been beautiful for about three and a half quarters. And I finally lifted my head up to look around to see where he was and he was gone. I didn't see him for 15 minutes and I caught up with him and he'd been crying. I've never been in a situation at a sporting event where the result has caused so much uh, angst and emotion uh, with a supporter group. Young Irishman Steins would recover from that crushing disappointment in his first VFL season to win the Brownlow medal just four years later. What Jimmy Steins has done from, from where I saw him come from, when he and Sean White were playing football for Melbourne and dropping marks and kicking the ball over the fence and just looking like they were totally lost out there. And to think that you can go from not having touched an oval ball, our ball, until you're probably 18 years of age and then become one of the greats of the game, it's, that's what sport does. It throws up those sort of stories. Hawthorne would fade in the heat against Carlton on grand final day of 1987, but bounce back to destroy Melbourne in the 1988 decider before qualifying for their seventh straight grand final in 1989. Their opponents would be Malcolm Blight's Geelong a free-flowing, high-scoring combination led by superstar full forward Gary Ablett. This one turned out to be the grand final that had it all. Wherever you pick a moment or pick a player in that game, it brings back a smile. At Dermot getting taken out in the first bounce by uh, Mark Yates, and then vomiting going down to the forward line, and, and Alan Jeans apparently sending the runner out, you're right, you're right, you've got to stay on. I don't think what Mark Yates did was the filthiest thing I've seen ever. I think, I think it was fair enough. Uh, the way the game was going to be played, because Dermot was going to run into the centre and take someone out. So Yatesy got in first. Dermot stays on and backs back into a pack about five minutes later. Don't even know what's coming and marks it and turns around and kicks a goal. I mean, it was just one of those grand finals where you think, well, what's going to happen next? The inexperienced Cats focused on being overtly physical and paid the price on the scoreboard. Hawthorne 40 points up at quarter time. Geelong regained their focus in the second term and went goal for goal with the Hawks throughout the middle two quarters. The Cats facing a six-goal deficit at the final change of a brutal encounter played at breakneck speed. And as much as Hawthorne kept on going ahead, Ablett and Geelong kept on staying with them. And then in the last quarter when Platt was off the ground and Dipper, Dipper got crunched with the ribs and you know, rushed to hospital after the game with a puncture alarm, Gazza got him. Just a terrible, terrible... <laughs> Some would say cowardly, but it was a grand final and you've got to win at all costs. And Ablett kicked nine. Destroyed Scotty McGuinness. Destroyed him. And I don't, I'm not saying that to put down Scotty McGuinness. I'm saying that to show that Gary Ablett in that, in that final series, he kicked seven the week before against Essendon. To show how great Gary Ablett was, he just put it on for, the, for the everyone. In the last quarter, Geelong came back. It was just an epic. It was like Ben Hur, the Ben Hur of football. With a couple of Hawthorne's prime movers effectively out of action and with Gary Ablett in unstoppable form, the Cats miraculously stormed home to close within a goal in the dying seconds. If the ball had gone down to Ablett, he would have grabbed it and done something with it. Uh, and had the game been replayed the next week, 
Geelong probably would have because so many Hawthorne players wouldn't have played. There's all but there as far as the Hawks are concerned. There's the siren. Hawthorne have won it by six points. A hard stopper. The wounded Hawks had hung on to win an all-time classic. Gary Ablett collected the Norm Smith medal for his nine-goal display of football perfection as Robert DiPier Domenico headed to hospital with a punctured lung. It was a game that had taken no prisoners. Players on both sides showing supreme courage and commitment. But there could be only one Premier. The Cats left with the hollow consolation of having played their part in one of the greatest games in football history. Grand final day 1990 had been pushed back to the first Saturday in October after Collingwood and West Coast had drawn and replayed their qualifying final at Waverley. The long-suffering Magpie Army hoped the date would be an omen. Could they finally break their September jinx by playing the grand final in October? The right foot snap, this is a miraculous kick. Their opponents, Kevin Sheedy's Bombers, had been flogged by the Pies just a fortnight earlier. The football world watching on with interest to see whether the famous Collie Wobbles would derail the black and white army once again. Fireworks were expected between these two bitter rivals and all hell broke loose right on the quarter time siren. And we thought this had happened very early on. They're not mucking around these guys. That was not good enough. You had an unsightly spectacle. Not only players grappling and king hitting, you had officials on the ground doing the same thing. And I think the AFL made a decision then and there we're going to make an example, and the example was Terry Denner, who got 11 weeks. Collingwood, enraged by the felling of Magpie favourite Gavin Brown, made their move after half-time. The Pies never giving the Collie Wobbles a look-in as they powered away to a 63-point win that sent the long-suffering Magpie army into unabated delirium. He need not even kick. The drought is over. The game's most famous run of grand final failures was finally over. They had the perfect captain in Tony Shaw for that, us against them. They had the perfect coach in Lee Matthews. And Elaine was the player who ended up with the ball at the end of the 1990 grand final, fittingly. Um, I think that ball went down a laundry chute in the Hilton Hotel that night with his brother Sean. I think that's how history tells it. The 1999 preliminary final between arch rivals Carlton and Essendon is widely regarded as one of the great games of the modern era. The Dons went in as unbackable favourites, having finished one game clear on top, then destroying the Swans by more than 11 goals to cruise straight through to preliminary final day. Carlton had finished in sixth position before being flogged by the Lions in their opening final to the tune of 73 points. They rebounded to beat West Coast in the first semi, but not even the most optimistic Carlton supporter gave their team much hope of rolling the Bombers, who were considered all but premiership certainties. So much so, in fact, that patrons entering the MCG walked past cocky Essendon fans already lining up for grand final tickets outside the ground. But the Blues weren't going to give in without a fight, and they jumped out of the blocks to stun the raging favourites and lead by 16 points at the first change. A wayward Essendon frittered their chances in the second term, adding just five behinds as Carlton seized an unlikely four-goal half-time lead. In the third quarter, Essendon men had their comeback. Everyone knew... Essendon were going to come back. And in the third quarter, they did. They kicked something like 7 7. Right? They, they, they could have been 40, 50 points up. That didn't happen. And then Carlton, and then Carlton just came back at Essendon in the last quarter. Despite having been completely outplayed in the third term, the Blues headed into the final term just 11 points down. The next half an hour would secure Carlton star Anthony Kudafidis his place in footy folklore. Kuda was simply unstoppable. He roamed all over the MCG at will in the last quarter, racking up 11 possessions, four marks, two goals, and setting up two more in one of the all-time great finals performances. As the Blues' confidence grew, Essendon's faded. The Dons sprang a series of chances in front of goal to leave themselves one point short of their rival. A game-saving tackle by Fraser Brown on Dean Wallace in the dying seconds saw the ball cleared and one of the greatest upsets in finals history, signed, sealed and delivered. Oh, this is uh, just an incredible comeback by the Carlton Football Club. They are into the grand final. Carlton, Carlton is into the grand final. The Blues shattering Essendon's 1999 premiership dream by a solitary point, despite finishing with nine fewer scoring shots. One of my everlasting memories of that game didn't actually happen on the field. I'm walking down Brunton Avenue, in front of me was about 60 Carlton supporters 
with their arms linked around each other's shoulders, singing da 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 da. And if anyone who doesn't vote for Carlton knows that song can really get under your skin. It really can. And that day they were singing it, and I thought to myself, they, they, I don't think Carlton supporters have been more happier in their lives than that day knocking over Essendon as underdogs. It was an amazing day. Another of Essendon's great foes around the turn of the century was Dennis Pagan's Kangaroos. The Bombers and Roos developed a fierce rivalry that bordered at times on open warfare. Kevin Sheedy labelling key North Melbourne football staff as soft as marshmallows before their 1998 qualifying final. The Roos prevailed that night by 22 points. Kangaroo fans letting Sheedy know all about it after the match. They were the toughest team in the competition in the mid-90s, the Kangaroos. Without a shadow of doubt, they were the toughest. And Kevin Sheedy said to the Essendon players, we must become tougher than the Kangaroos. We must. Right? The Bombers turned the tables in early 1999, claiming their round two meeting over the Roos by 35 points. By round 17, the two teams sat one game clear of the rest of the competition. Outright premiership favouritism on the line as they headed to the MCG. Essendon that day decided to target Wayne Carey. Pinch him, punch him, run into him, swear at him, whatever you do, get into him. Carey loved it. He loved the way Dean Solomon and these guys and Damien Hardwick were coming up to him and saying, you're, de you're dead, Duck Duck was like gladiator, you know, Maximus, woo, who are you talking to, right? I'll unleash hell. And he did. I think Lloyd got eight or nine or something like that, and Carey kicked ten, including one left foot banana from the boundary Carey, I was talking to Robert Shaw after the game, who was then assistant coach. He said, we will never target Wayne Carey again. Despite Carey's defiant haul, the Bombers prevailed by 26 points in one of the great modern-day shootouts. History was made when the two teams met yet again two years later. It was round 16, 2001, and despite entering the match three games clear on top of the table, the Bombers were stunned by a blistering 12-goal opening term from the Kangas. The boys from Arden Street exploding away to a 58-point lead at the first change. Kangaroos that day got to 69 points up, and we thought they were gone. And then they slowly came back. I can still remember James Hurd just imposing himself on the game. And it wasn't the first time he did it for Essendon, and it certainly wasn't the last time he did it for Essendon. The roar started getting back. And once you get the crowd back into your team, amazing things happen, and that day they come back. The Bombers reeled them in. That was, to see the game played as it was that day, that was just one team backing its skill against the other and then the better team prevailing. Uh, it, it was just a fantastic display of what this game can do. One of the very best ever matches played on this It would be the greatest comeback in league history. Essendon storming back from 69 points down at the 10 minute mark of the second quarter to win a 52 goal classic by 12 points. There had been a chronic shortage of thrilling grand finals in the lead up to the 2005 and 2006 deciders between Sydney and West Coast. However, these two teams proved themselves to be as evenly matched as any in the history of football, making for two of the most compelling playoffs our game has ever seen. Their 2005 qualifying final at Subiaco was a thriller. The Eagles winning by four points after a controversial free kick in the dying stages. And come grand final day of 2005, there was still nothing between these two teams. Three unanswered second quarter goals had given the Swans a 20 point half time lead. But West Coast hit back to narrow the gap to just two points at the last change. Embley scrubs the kick. Canelli got a bad bounce. Hanson! Hanson's nailed it! The final term was agonisingly tense. West Coast hitting the front before Sydney answered. With just seconds remaining, Dean Cox launched the ball long and deep into the Eagles' 50. Roll of the dice for the Eagles! Leo Barry, you star! Bob Murray, William Kane. The longest premiership drought in football history is over. For the first time in 72 years, the Swans are champions of the AFL. The greatest day I've had at the football, and purely because of the result, was um, when the Swans beat West Coast. 72 year wait, um, and they finally got there, and Leo Barry's mark, the siren, I, I've never been as, as excited and almost as, uh, as emotionally drained as I was that day. I just loved it as a sports story. You know, this great wait, and to see the Skilton round 
and all the South Melbourne people, genuine Clarendon Street South Melbourne people, take joy out of that. It's just the most memorable result I've seen. But the Sydney West Coast rivalry was only just beginning. The two four-point results from the 2005 final series were followed by a two-point game in round 15 of 2006, then a one-point qualifying final. Having both re-qualified for the 2006 Premiership decider, the football world prepared for another heartstopper, and they weren't to be disappointed. This time around, it was West Coast's turn to gain the early ascendancy, pulling out to a 25-point half-time lead. Across to Cousins, he's been running all year, and he's finishing strongly. But sure enough, the Swans came storming back to set up another nail-biting finale. As an amazing postscript, the two teams would go on to play out yet another one-point game in the opening round of 2007, stamping Sydney and West Coast's incredible run of close finishes as the tightest rivalry in league history. Six matches decided by a cumulative total of just 13 points, including three consecutive one-point margins. Australian football has provided us with 150 years of priceless memories to savour. From superstar players, to bombshell front page news stories, to classic finishes that had our hearts pounding, there has never been a dull moment. Happy 150th birthday, footy, and may your next 150 years be every bit as memorable as your first 150. It continues to get bigger, stronger and more popular, as fans of all generations continue to marvel at the game that never sleeps, our game.